Hello, and welcome to the Realizing Improvement Through Team Empowerment Program. This is David Larson, and today's topic is the Key Driver Diagram. There's a lot to talk about, so I've broken this topic into two parts. This first part focuses mainly on the theory of improvement. Up to now, we've spent our time on the left-hand side of the A3, defining the problem, evaluating the current state, setting a goal, and understanding the root causes of the problem. Now we're going to move to the right-hand side of the A3 to start into problem solving. The key driver diagram is a tool that provides a structured method for problem solving in a complex environment. So let's start with a case study. Say you went to your doctor and she told you that you have high blood pressure. What would you expect that she will tell you next? What if her response was, you're going to need to keep a food journal? You would probably be confused and frustrated because she just jumped to a single solution without understanding your specific situation. But if you think about it, this approach to problem solving is not at all uncommon in our organizations. Few doctors would ever do this. Instead of jumping to a single solution, it's more likely that your doctor would better understand your lifestyle, explain the common causes of high blood pressure, and work with you to help you figure out what strategies will work for you to help decrease your blood pressure. This may include that you may need to lose weight, eat a healthy diet, cut out salt, exercise, limit your alcohol intake, or manage your stress. Now these are important concepts, and they're all true, but they don't represent tangible actions you can take. For example, if you want to cut out salt, you're going to have to have some specific strategies to make that happen. Perhaps you'll try taking the salt shaker off the dinner table. You might try cooking your own food at home. You might try ordering foods without salt when eating out at restaurants. Similarly, you might think of specific actions you can take to improve your diet. You might want to eat more fruits and vegetables. Or more specifically, you might need to incorporate into your weekly grocery shopping list enough fruit to have, say, at least two pieces a day. Perhaps you'll keep a food journal to better monitor your eating. Perhaps you'll find someone who can help be your diet coach. So in this context, you can now understand why your doctor wants you to keep a food journal, because she thinks it might help you improve your diet, which will help decrease your blood pressure. Now that you understand the reasoning behind it, you might readily accept your doctor's advice and go ahead and start a journal. Or, on the other hand, you might say to her, I understand why you're recommending that I keep a food journal, but I know myself and I'm pretty sure that's not going to work for me. But I have some other ideas about how to improve my diet that I think will work for me. Your physician most likely would be delighted to hear this and would encourage you to do whatever works for you to improve your diet. So this is the same approach that we use for problem solving in, a co in quality improvement. A fundamental concept in process improvement is that certain inputs executed in certain ways will result in certain outcomes. In other words, we can control what outcomes we get by controlling what inputs are used and how they're used. If we want to think of this mathematically, we can say that outcomes are a function of inputs. It's just like saying that y is a function of multiple variables, such as x1, x2, x3, and x4. Or, to use quality improvement language, we're saying that our process outcomes are a function of our key drivers. Again, most of the time, the outcomes that a process produces are a function of not just one input, but many inputs. For example, they may depend on operator skill, the consistent use of standard techniques, tools, facilities, organizational design, culture, and most likely a whole host of factors. It's important to recognize that we cannot directly control the outcomes, we can only control the inputs and change them in a way that will produce the outcomes that we want. That implies that we need to specify what outcomes we want and then understand how changing our inputs will affect those outcomes. Now, we don't ever know exactly how changes in our inputs will affect our outcomes. Hopefully we have an idea, but until it's proven, it's still a theory. This then is our theory of improvement. That is, if we change certain inputs in a certain way, we believe that will lead to the desired outcomes. This theory becomes the basis for our improvement efforts. At first, we don't know for sure whether they will work, but we think they might, so we're going to try them out and see if they work. If our theory doesn't work out, in other words, if we try our interventions but they don't result in the outcomes we're hoping for, then there may be one of two problems. Either our inputs really aren't strongly related to our outcomes and thus are unable to produce our desired outcomes, or we haven't implemented the changes correctly. For example, I might think that the reason I've gotten warts is because I've been handling toads. Or I might think that, the, that quality defects are a result of sloppiness of the workers, which I believe is a result of their bad attitudes. In reality, it's very likely that neither of these inputs are strongly associated with the outcomes that I want. 
On the other hand, the inputs may be reasonable, but the implementation or other persistent problems in the system may prevent us from achieving the desired results. For example, we might wish to increase our throughput by purchasing a faster machine. However, if we place the machine at the far end of the factory, transportation delays may negate our efficiency gains. Or, we might train our workers to be very highly skilled in operating the machinery, but the quality of the product may still be compromised if the machine blades are dull. Therefore, because we don't know for sure whether or not it will work, we treat our improvement plan as a theory until proven otherwise. This starts out as a collection of untested ideas that, again, may or may not work. With preliminary testing, we may find that the idea works in some settings. With further refinement and testing, we may get it to work well in some settings. With testing and context, we may demonstrate that it can work well in our setting. With further refinement and validation, we can demonstrate that it is working well in our setting. And by implementing it and closely monitoring it, we can show that it currently is working well in our setting when implemented. So what we are talking about here is testing our possible solutions many times. In other words, these are testing cycles. As we run any test, we should follow a simple procedure. First, we should plan the test, then we should do the test, then we should study or check the results, then we should act upon the results, based on, and based on the results, we should think of our next test and run it again. This doesn't have to be elaborate, but the test should have at least some basic structure. This is known as the plan, do, study, act cycle, or the plan, do, check, act cycle. Often, you'll see this abbreviated as PDSA cycle or PDCA cycle. For the purposes of today's discussion, they're the same thing. Also, as you're testing, you want the test to be as small as possible because you're going to have to run many tests in the course of a project. So when you see the term PDSA or PDCA, just replace that in your mind with small test of change. Again, PDSA or PDCA equals small test of change. So this is perhaps the most critical concept to understand in all of quality improvement, namely that we don't know whether a solution will work at first, so we have to test it. Gradually, as we refine and continue to test our changes, our degree of belief increases to the point that we're confident that it will work. This is how an idea matures to become a proven solution. So we're going to stop at this point. In part two, we'll talk about the specific process we use to move our solutions from ideas to proven fact. Thank you for watching. This is David Larson with the Realizing Improvement through Team Empowerment Program.